Hey everybody, this is Dr. Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University, and this is the first video in a series for Microbiology of Infectious Diseases, a lower division microbiology course. Now a prereq for this class is to have had at least one semester of chemistry, and we do need to be able to talk about chemicals and talk about some basic chemical principles in this class. So rather than me reviewing those things in class and using class time, I've created some uh, review videos for you as well as some other documents that you can find on Canvas. In this first video on chemistry review, we're going to just review the chemical bonds. I want to make sure everybody remembers what a covalent bond is, what an ionic bond and a hydrogen bond are. All three are very important in the world of microbiology. And, and with the covalent bonds, we want to further uh, distinguish between polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. So let's jump into those covalent bonds and spend a few minutes reviewing. If you remember, a covalent bond is simply formed when two atoms share a pair of electrons. These are relatively strong bonds, particularly um, in, in organic compounds. And the polar covalent bonds result when uh, one of the two atoms is hanging on to the electrons more of the time than the other atom. In other words, it's a more electronegative atom. So for example, in water here on the right hand side, you can see we've got some H2O. Oxygen is highly electronegative. And so even though hydrogen and oxygen are sharing a pair of electrons, which stabilizes them both, and we'll talk about why it stabilizes them in just a minute, uh, the electrons are spending more time around the oxygen than they are around the hydrogen. And so what we end up with is a partial negative charge around the oxygen and a partial positive charge or an absence of that partial negative charge from those electrons around the hydrogen atom. This is what we call a polar covalent bond. On the left hand side we have a methane molecule, CH4. And you notice that in this case there's none of these little partial charges written, the little uh, delta negative or delta positive, and that's because carbon to carbon is shared very equally and carbon to hydrogen is also shared very equally. And so we have nonpolar covalent bonds from carbon to carbon and carbon to hydrogen. We have polar covalent bonds, particularly when oxygen or nitrogen are involved. And the best are going to be the oxygen to hydrogen and nitrogen to hydrogen in particular. And so we can learn a lot about the way these molecules are going to behave, really, just by looking at the atoms involved in the bonds and knowing a little something about polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. Now, I said that um, these bonds are formed, these electrons are shared in order to stabilize the atoms. And it turns out that most atoms are stable when they have four pairs of electrons in their outermost shell. Um, if you don't remember orbitals and shells, go back and review that from chapter two. Hydrogen is the one exception where hydrogen, because it has one proton, shows up essentially with one electron. That's the way to think about it. That single electron needs to be paired off, but it doesn't need four pairs. And therefore, hydrogen likes to enter into one covalent bond with another atom that has a, an electron that it needs to pair off. And when they share those electrons, then essentially they've stabilized both of their outermost electron shells. So for example, hydrogen can be single bonded to hydrogen. Okay, that's H2. They're both happy because there's a pair of electrons between them and they each, each nucleus of the atom needs two electrons around it to be stable. So hydrogen gas is H2, is a hydrogen form. And because of this, hydrogen is always gonna form one covalent bond with something, whether it's another hydrogen or something else, right? So think about H2O. H2O are hydrogens are each forming one bond with oxygen. But how many bonds is the oxygen forming? And you see we've got one and then two. And the reason oxygen is forming two bonds is because in oxygen's valence, it has two, four, five, six electrons, meaning that it needs to pair off this one and this one here. And so oxygen is going to, to be most stable, need to form two bonds. And so H2O is a perfect way to do that. Oxygen can also form a double bond with itself to form molecular oxygen, O2. And now each of those two atoms is stable because it has two shared pairs. We would call that a double covalent bond. 
So if you look at nitrogen, how many is it going to need? It's going to need one, two, three, and therefore nitrogen likes to form three covalent bonds. And carbon needs to form one, two, three, four, and it needs then four covalent bonds. So for example, you could have carbon with four hydrogens around it like we saw in methane on the last slide. Now your carbon has four shared pairs all around it and that stabilizes it. And each of your hydrogens has one pair, even though it's shared, around its, uh, its center, around its proton. And that's gonna stabilize that, uh, that particular atom. So here's a molecule I drew that has a problem. Let's see if we can figure out what the problem is. Our hydrogens each have one, 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 this is this represents OH. So hydrogens all look good. They've each got one uh, single bond around them, so a shared pair. Your nitrogen is one, two, three, like it's supposed to. Uh, this carbon here has one, two, three, four, like it's supposed to. This oxygen here has one, two. This oxygen here has one, two. But the carbon here only has one, two, three. You see that? There's something missing. There's a bond missing to satisfy that carbon. Now, if we just replace that whole carbonyl group with this hydrogen here, everything is hunky-dory. And this is the amino acid glycine. So here's your amino group. Here's your acidic carboxyl group. Your carbons all have four uh, bonds around them. Hydrogen's all one oxygens two and nitrogens three. And that's why this glycine is a, a, a molecule that can be stable in nature. Now we've shown a lot of structural formulas. Can you figure out a structural formula just from its chemical formula? Well, if you know this octet rule, then you can. If we've got a couple carbons and we need to have six hydrogens around them, we know our carbons have to have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four in order to, uh, uh, to be stable. And that's one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens around it. So as quickly as that, we could determine from C2H6 what the basic structural and two-dimension uh, basic structural formula is for ethane. All right, so those are the covalent bonds, polar and nonpolar. We'll come back to those in just a minute as we think about solubility and protein folding. Um, ionic bonds are when we have full charges, not just partial charges, right? Remember, with water, we've got these covalent bonds that have partial positive and partial negative charges. Well, an ionic bond is really just a polar covalent bond taken to, taken to the extreme to where one atom fully hogs the electrons and doesn't share them at all with the other atom. So sodium chloride. Right? One atom is going to have all the electrons, and when we put it in water, we see which one. The chlorine is going to hog the electrons. The sodium doesn't get any, and in water, we can stabilize the sodium and stabilize the chlorine, and it's going to dissolve. Uh, those, full charges, um, those full charges really attract water molecules to them. Same with calcium chloride. And so in water, these ionic bonds can be pretty weak, but if they're out of water, say table salt, they're going to be extremely strong. And then finally, hydrogen bonds, which remember we can think of them as sort of baby ionic bonds. Hydrogen bonds happen when you've got polar covalent bonds, like here's a water molecule, right? Here's a polar covalent bond. We've got a partial positive around our hydrogen, two partial negatives around our oxygen. The partial positives of one water molecule are going to be attracted to the partial negatives of another and vice versa, the partial positives of the other attracted to the partial negatives of the other. This is why molecules like water have a certain cohesiveness to them, and they stick together. Water is somewhat sticky to itself because of these hydrogen bonds. Now, frequently hydrogen bonds include hydrogen, though they don't always. Frequently they include nitrogen or oxygen, though they don't always. Now, individually you can imagine this is a pretty weak bond, but collectively they really do add up and make a difference. And we'll see that especially in DNA as an example. Here's a water molecule. It's going to have its partial positive charges around the hydrogen. It's going to have a couple partial negative charges around the oxygen. And the partial positives around the hydrogens are going to be attracted in this case to the partial negatives around this nitrogen in ammonia. And I'm not drawing an eight here. I'm drawing a, doing a bad job of drawing a Greek letter delta with a negative ch partial negative charge. And these hydrogens will have a partial positive charge around them. And so you can see that it really, uh, the, the, these polar covalent bonds and the partial charges that they leave behind can really determine the solubility of a molecule.
So hydrophilic molecules are those that have one or more regions of either polarity or full ionic charges because water molecules and its, their partial charges love to interact with the full charges on ions. A hydrophobic molecule, on the other hand, is going to have no regions of polarity and no ionic charges. Right? So for example, sodium chloride is going to be very hydrophilic and therefore very soluble because of those full ionic charges around them. Ammonia, NH3, is also because of the, part, the uh, polar covalent bonds between the nitrogen and the hydrogen and all the little uh, partial charges that are formed there. However, a molecule like methane that we looked at earlier has really nothing to attract water, and so it's going to have a very low solubility. So um, these charges, these bonds, the polarities can all have a big role in determining solubility of a molecule. Let's take a look at a couple examples. Here's alpha D glucose. If you look at it in its linear form, we see a lot of OH functional groups. You see those? And remember, an OH functional group, R just means everything else, going to oxygen, going to hydrogen. Oxygen, we said, is really electronegative. It's going to hold on to those electrons, and it's going to leave our hydrogen with a partial positive charge around them. And we've got a lot of polarity at all of these hydroxyl groups. And therefore, a sugar like alpha-D-glucose is going to be hydrophilic. It's going to dissolve very well. Here's the, the basic steroid ring structure, like the structure that testosterone is built on or cholesterol is built on. And you notice all we've got are carbon-to-hydrogen bonds and carbon-to-carbon -carbon bonds, which are nonpolar, and there's no sign of any charges. And therefore, there's nothing about this molecule to draw water to it. And in fact, it's going to be hydro. Phobic. So we can determine a lot or predict a lot about solubility based on charges and partial charges. All of these bonds, covalent, including the, the uh, polar, nonpolar, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, and then what we call hydrophobic interactions, all of these bonds and interactions are important, for example, in how a protein folds. A protein is one or more chains of amino acids folded back onto itself into a three-dimensional structure. IgG happens to be an antibody made up of multiple protein chains all interacting with each other. In order for IgG to form, we need covalent bonds, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, and then hydrophobic regions, and in particular amino acids that have hydrophobic R groups, are going to bury themselves in the interior of the folded protein as far away from water as they can get because they're hydrophobic and as close to one another, to other hydrophobic regions as possible. And that can have a real strong impact on how a protein folds. All right, let's summarize the key points before we wrap this up. Nonpolar covalent bonds form when electrons are shared equally between atoms, such as carbon to carbon, in carbon to hydrogen. Polar covalent bonds form when electrons are unequally shared between atoms, most commonly, though not exclusively, oxygen to hydrogen and nitrogen to hydrogen. Ionic bonds result from the attraction of oppositely charged atoms like sodium and chlorine, really just an extreme case of polarity. And then hydrogen bonds happen when the, these partial charges that form around the polar covalent bonds are then attracted to each other. And then finally, solubility. And as one example, protein folding. These lots of important biological chemistries are determined by both charge and polarity. Okay, I hope you learned a lot. hope this was useful to you. Watch it as many times as you like. Go back to chapter two in your textbook. Use all the resources you can to review this basic chemistry. Good luck to you guys.